Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, celebrated drummer for Tina Turner and Joe Cocker, Jack Bruno. And now, Rich Redman. All right. What is up, rock and rollers? Yeah, all those folks out in podcast land. That's you. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. This is another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. I got a friend on the show today. Guys, since the 1970s, this gentleman has had the best seat in the house playing drums for the likes of Tina Turner, a gig that he has held down for 28 years, Joe Cocker, 21 years, and then some other slackers like Elton John, Taj Mahal, Richard Marks, Peter Frampton, and many others. He's got a rock solid groove. He's a rock solid guy. He's my friend, and we're lucky to have him right here in Nashville, Tennessee. Jack Bruno. What's up, Jack? Hey, Rich. How you doing, man? Dude, thanks for doing this. Let me get these. Watch readers. out. Don't poke Come your on. eye out. You're going to poke your eye out, kid. <laughs> Just coming back from the holidays. No, I, you know, it's so funny. I'm wearing these ridiculous readers um, since the last time I saw you, and we had that beer maybe like three years ago. Now I need readers, man. I mean, it's just this is happening. Yeah. It just hit overnight. I'm sorry. Yeah, and it's going <laughs> to get worse, Rich. I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, to a point, you know, you're just going to have to have them on all the time. So let's get used. To yeah, I got the um, I got the surgery on my eye. I got the uh, cataracts removed, and the doctor was like, "You're the youngest person ever in the history of the world to ever have cataracts." And they go in there and they scream for that. Yeah, and then they they actually inserted these lenses in my eyes, and they're going to be there until like I'm in the dirt, you know, which is pretty incredible technology. Did that help? It didn't help, obviously, with your reading vision. <laughs> well, the thing is, no, but what it is, is the first time in my life, I can wake up in the morning and see a mile outside of my bed. I can read the alarm clock, and it's for the first time ever. It's just the unfortunate thing when you're trying to read a cue card or a piece of music, you got to put on readers. Yeah, so you have your distance is good. Your distance yeah. vision is great. I'm rocking that, cool. man. Yeah. That's, so well, Mine you, both suck. Carry yeah. On. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember in the day playing, you know, before I got contacts, I remember playing drums with with glasses on. And unfortunately, sometimes that stick would get under there. Whoosh, you'd fling them across the room and then the dancers would crush them. And you're like, well, I'm not making any money tonight. That is, that's happened to me. It's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> or you smack yourself in the face or you hit your ear. Yeah. You know. The, yeah. Slice your ear with a broken drumstick. Um, so you've called Nashville home for like, is it 20 years now? It's 20. Fuck, man, I can't even do the math. It's been since the early 95. So yeah. what is that? 26 years? Yeah. 26 years? Ma, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Longest, not, longest I've lived anywhere. Yeah. And I moved here in 97. So like I'm right on your heels there with about 23 years. <sighs> Um, but you did a lot of cutting of teeth in Los Angeles. And then if we take it back even further now, am I right? When looking up the wiki and everything, we've never discussed this. Are your roots in Boston originally? Yeah. I grew up in Boston. How you pack the um, car, pack the car, pack the car. Yeah, you do have to pack it. Uh, yeah. I, I, I miss it. I like Boston a lot. There's a yeah. lot of great stuff going on there. It's multicultural. Uh, there's great music going on there, great musicians. There still is. There's, you know, it's a great place. It has a lot to offer except for the winter. <clears throat> yeah, such an old city. And, when, and, and when you're trying to, like, get around that city, I think that's, that's you figure out, like, wow, they were just kind of winging it, man. Like, there's a lot of one ways. <clears throat> Driving, uh, driving's not good downtown. Um, you can't drive around the block. It's nothing square. They're cow right. pass, you know, they're just, if you try to go around the block, you're going to get lost. You, you can't do it. It's not like New York. Everything's on a grid. And yeah. So it's, yeah and it's nuts, but it's yeah. great. So, and then the drums, like the drums, everybody has their original story. This is kind of a story like, oh, my grandfather had some old drums in the attic and I went up there one day and I knew yeah. exactly what to play. And but, but so you were, you started early and then joined your first rock band at at 12. So what's the story? Tell us about your family. You had musicians in the family. Yeah. Um, all of my father's uh, brothers and, uh, and there were uh, five of them. And then there were three girls, one of which played, they all played 
including his dad. They all played something. Um, keys, horns, uh, one of them played violin, reeds. Um, some did it professionally, some not. Uh, my dad did not. He played vibes. He played some organ. Uh, they all played something. Nice. Uh, so I was around a lot of music. That was that was the thing. So I don't know how the drums came in. M- my best recollection is just me banging on something and uh, uh, something that my grandmother gave me. And uh, one of my uh, cousins was a professional drummer, and he, he gave me a lesson. And uh, he and uh, he, he came to uh, came to the house and. He showed me uh, one like rudiment, like a, like a paradiddle. And he said, okay, you just practice that, you know. And at the end of the summer, it was like, yeah, all right, I, I'm still into it. So we just carried on, took some lessons, continued on. So and, it, yeah. it, anyway, um, so yeah, that was the start of that. And then he was the same guy. And a few years later, that was the same guy who turned me on to this, these kids that lived behind him that had a rock band and they needed a drummer. So, and then that was the end of my lessons and the end of my formal training. Right. <laughs> so so you join, you're joining a rock band at 12, band. right? You join a rock band at 12, but then you get a record deal at the tender age of 16. What's that all about? I mean, yeah. talk about a crash course in the music business. When I was 16... I was just practicing along to police records and fantasizing about this rock stardom. You got a record deal. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, between 12 and that point in time, played with a bunch of, you know, different kid bands and stuff, doing whatever, the usual stuff, yeah. dances. And, but uh, then I got connected with some older guys, uh, older meaning, you know, I was like, I was 14 coming up to 15 or something like that. And they were probably, you know, 20. Right, <laughs> you know? Right. So, so uh, we, um, I just started playing around with them and playing in Boston. I got turned on to all kinds of cool stuff at that point. M- music I'd never even heard before, you know, it's like, wow, what is this Bob Dylan stuff like that? The birds. It's like, I wasn't even aware of these guys at this point at 14, 15 years old, but um. So, yeah, and then we started playing in downtown Boston and hanging around downtown Boston a lot, coffee houses, and uh, <clears throat> some uh, – this club owner, we were uh, we were practicing at this guy's club, and um, he said, I got this girl singer. You know, she joined the band. Uh, she was living in New York at the time. She said, we, we need to go back to uh, New York for uh, – We'll play at the Bitter End. We can play there. I know that guy, and uh, we'll invite people down, and we'll get a manager, and you know, maybe we can get a record deal. That was the, that was that. So we went to New York for the summer. I was uh, summer of '67. I was 16 years old, and um, we got a manager, and we yeah. got a record deal with Atlantic. <laughs> it was like it happened. It was that fast. It was crazy, you know. But, but those those were the days. I mean, they were signing everybody. You know, Boston had this thing called the Boston Sound. You know, they were trying to push. And, uh, so, you know, we were part of that whole thing. Yeah. Uh, there were other bands there. Ultimate Spinach was one. Uh, uh, Skunk Baxter was in that band. Uh, Orpheus was another one. Uh, anyway, there were a bunch of, of Boston bands. But, yeah, we got a deal. We did two albums, probably sold about 20, you know, and the band broke up. Is this is this the uh, apple pie motherhood band? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a mouthful, man. Is it, so is the music? Well, it, it they shortened it to apple pie. So. Apple pie. Okay, okay. And then there was a country rock band like uh, fifteen years ago called Hot Apple Pie. Crazy. Don't remember. Yeah, they came and went. You know, a uh, couple friends in the band. Yeah, so did we. Yeah. <laughs> so so what was that? What was that process like? Did you have a producer kind of breathing down your neck, or or was it just like, all right, let's capture it, boom, kick it off? And we had, you know, I I wish I had known the gravity of the situation I was in because we were recording at Atlantic Studios, the original Atlantic Studios in New York. On I can't remember where they were, fifty fifth, fifty sixth. Uh, I can't remember now by Columbus Circle. Incredible. Yeah, uh, Tom Dowd was the engineer. Uh, Felix Popolardi was the was the producer, and we were just these just crazy hippies, you know, in this studio. And we had friends coming in, and people were taking all kinds of stuff. We were trying to record a record, and uh, we were known as a psychedelic blues band. So I'll leave it to your imagination. Well, so were there yeah, shuffle? Some of this stuff on the, Spotify. Can you find it? 
or no? Uh, I don't know if it's on Spotify. I never go to Spotify, but um, uh, probably there may be something on YouTube if you look it up. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, just audio stuff. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. So anyway, Jacker, it was an interesting time, but shoot. No, you you yeah, you, know, you finish your thought there. I'm sorry. There's that lag in Zoom, and it really screws us up sometimes. <laughs> there is a little bit of a lag, but my Wi-Fi here is really good. Uh, I've never had an issue with it before. Yeah, yeah. I've done Zoom calls. So yeah. 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 Um, anyway, um, no, I, it was just an amazing time to be working with those guys. I, I had no idea that I hadn't heard of Tom Down. Felix Papalardi was a, a, a bass player, and uh, um. I think he ended up playing Mountain or something like that. Wasn't he in Mountain? Remember those guys? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mississippi Leslie West. Queen. Yeah. Yes. Um, anyway, that was that. But, yeah. you know, we went on the road behind those, traveling around in a van and all that kind of stuff. And so your parents had to be pretty dang supportive clothes. to say, like, yeah, go spend the entire summer in New York. And my mom would be like, where are you eating? Where are you staying? Who are your friends? I want their numbers. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. At, at that age, really, I would have been doing the same things my kid or kids. Um, they were very supportive. They knew the guy, one of the guys in particular who was older and was a pretty responsible cat. And it was just going to be for the summer until we got the manager and the deal. And I said, ah, I want to stay here. I still had a year of high school left. So um, the stipulation was, yeah, you can stay uh, I need to speak to my dad. I was like, yeah, I need to speak to your manager and uh, you need to get into school for a year. So they made that happen and I finished high school. And well, that was good. That was a good decision. I am. Yeah. I mean, all <laughs> yeah. these years later with that natural that. ability. I mean, because when, when, if anybody watches you play, it's like total command of the instrument. The quarter note is king, laying it down, super solid. Uh, you're like a songwriter's meat potatoes, baby. weapon, baby. Yeah, meat and potatoes. I'm I'm pretty simple. I, I, you know, not having been trained, I'm sorry, I, I didn't. I really am at this point, but I did take more lessons and learn some t- technique, even how to hold sticks properly. You know, at this point. But um, yeah, it was uh, definitely uh, you know learning on the job, playing a lot of different stuff, um, and um. You know, uh, meat and potatoes. Yeah. You know, for yeah, the most yeah. part, you know. I mean, Jack, I mean, it, holding it, down it definitely worked can. out. It definitely worked out. I remember, you know, being a child of MTV, you know, you know, Nina Blackwood, JJ Jackson, Martha Quinn, you know, being glued to that thing. It's like, wow, there's like videos of music and they play them all day, 24 hours a day. And they even had like live concerts. And so this was, I'm thinking like 80. 182, 83, 84, and there when when Tina's starting to catch fire and there's like live concerts and you're in all the videos with your black leather pants. I'm like, who's that guy? And then the the duet with uh, Brian Adams, you know, um, yeah, do do bah, man, just just I was like, who's that guy? You know, um, your hair was black. How that, old were you then. at that point? I was uh, in eighty yeah. one. I was eleven. So. But yeah, but but the thing is, is that it seems like as you get older, like I feel like you and I at this point, we're the same age, you know, but when I was back well, then, definitely. I was like, who's that guy? And how do you do that? And how do you get that job? And, you know, it was like a fantasy. Yeah. And now we're friends. And you got one. You're in. You hear it. Somehow. <laughs> You're doing it. Yeah. We're- <laughs> exactly. How that happened. But it was so inspiring, man. And then so, you know, a lot of things in the music business come down to relationships. So, like, I listened to other interviews, um, you know, that you've done. And and a lot of things were, like, word of mouth and people championing you and you taking a job and knocking it out of the ballpark and continuing to do that. And then a lot of this is um, location, 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 like an, like a good restaurant. You can have the greatest food in the world, but you got to be at the right street corner. And you went to L.A. What got you out there? I wasn't doing anything. I was living in uh, upstate New York with my wife. We had, I had been, you know, uh, bouncing around a few bands with some of the same guys. We were bouncing around, you know, Boston, Rhode Island, Providence, uh, upstate New York. We were just doing stuff, you know, trying to play and make stuff happen. And 
nothing happened. And I, I had a couple of pals who lived out. I was living in upstate New York on this horse farm. I was working in this restaurant during the day. I was playing in this club on weekends. Um, I had a couple of friends living in L.A., uh, three, actually, at the time. And uh, one of them, uh, you know, we'd speak from time to time. And he said, you know, you should come out here. You know, I'm going to send you a Sunday L.A. Times. So check it out. Look at the apartments and all that kind of stuff, you know. Think about it, you know. So he sent me this big ass, you know, L.A. Times. And I'm looking through it. And it's like, oh, we just decided to make the move. You know, we, we bought a van. We, uh, we, you know, I, I, I had nothing to say before, uh, in upstate New York. So we bought a van. We, uh, built this lofty bed in there. We had two dogs. We put, uh, as much stuff in there as we could. One big, uh, we didn't get a passenger chair for the van. So, because we wanted to put our living room chair in that spot. So, uh, we, uh, we did that and drove out and, um, uh, I, I, you know, I went out with the intent of just trying to play music, trying to play music for a living. That was it. I had no other, I didn't want to be a studio guy. I didn't, I, I, I didn't have those kind of focus. I just wanted to do music. I wanted to work, play. Maybe. Yeah. So this and was, there was your, a lot of it around at that point in time. Yeah. You know, it, is this, was 19, your, is this your uh, wife that you have now? You were married way back then? Yeah. No, no, no. We're still married. Yeah. We had just gotten married. At that time. How, well, how long have you been yeah, married, so Jack? 40 soon, 47 years. Wow. Yeah. But, you know, you can stay married a long time if you spend a lot of time on the road. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking that that is either going to be, depending on the, the personalities and the, the how those two personalities fit together, a very, the road is a very good thing or a very bad thing. It sounds like it was a good thing because it kept the... Uh, you know, if you love someone, set them free kind of a thing. And when you came back, it was like, wow, because well, we didn't have FaceTime. We had, no, it was, we didn't have calling cards. No, there was no FaceTime. You know, we were exactly, or we, you know, sneaking into the production office to make a free phone call, you know, uh, at the gigs. But, um, no, my wife, you know, we had been together on and off for, for a little while. I'd met her a few years earlier, but I was always a musician. She knew what I was doing. And, uh, never tried to stop that in any way so you know when i started getting work it was a great thing you know going on the road okay it's fine it's a great thing yeah so uh it worked out i mean i was probably away from home too much when my kids were growing up but um they were living well so you know it worked out yeah now are you granddad now or do you got some grandkids oh no No. not that i know (laughs) Um, so tell us about this, this, uh, this famous Tina Turner audition. You've told the story a million times, but it really speaks to the power of relationships and friendships and paying it forward. And, and, you know, uh, how you got that audition and how it came about through a friend. Okay. Um, just bouncing around LA playing with different people doing different stuff. Um, you know, there was a lot going on in LA at that point in time, a lot. It was a great time to be there. Um, a lot of work. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> uh, things would come up hearing about the auditions at that point was kind of the tricky part it was the hardest part. If you could hear about the auditions and get to it, you're, you'd, you're good, but yeah. find it out about it. But anyways, something passed my name along to somebody who was Tina's current road manager he called me up and um asked me to come do an audition and i said yeah no problem i never heard from him again you know a couple of weeks three weeks later i called him up and, you know what's going on he said you got somebody do you know any guitar player so i was working with a guitar player two couple of guys i'd been working with i gave him numbers and um one of the guys got the gig um who I'm still friends with, um, and you know, I do tracks for him and stuff like that. Anyway, um, he uh, got the gig, and then I can't remember how long it was. Weeks, a month later, maybe at the most, she wasn't happy with the guy they hired. My friend returned the favor and said, "Call Jack." And uh, I went to San Francisco. They were playing up at the Fairmont Hotel. 
<clears throat> excuse me, which uh, she was doing a lot of in those days. Um, and I did, and I went and uh, played, did this, it was just her and my guitar player friend. That was it. I think we played Nut Bush, River Deep, and Proud Mary, of course. And that was it. Yeah. I was hired. Love it. Yeah, guitar, guitar drums, and chick singer. Yeah. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. That's awesome. So uh, that's a, that's a wonderful story, and you're still friends with the gentleman. That's a, that's awesome. Speaks to your character, uh, integrity. So you get the gig, and Tina Turner is coming out of Ike and Tina Turner, and she's kind of coasting on some of that success. She hadn't got the makeover with the leather skirt and the jean jacket all over MTV yet. So you're doing the ballrooms and the parties no. and stuff, right? Yeah, we're doing, you know, this hotel things, uh, fair, lots of Fairmont hotels. You know, we do uh, two weeks. Uh, they'd have showrooms in those places and uh, uh, two weeks, six nights a week, two shows a night. Um, you know, you do that in San Francisco, you do it in Houston, Dallas, Toronto, wherever. We did a lot of that. And then there were little bits and pieces of gigs in, in Europe. There were still some places, you know, where she could go and do some stuff. So we did travel a little bit over the UK and I remember going to Spain. I think it was 1981 or so we went to, uh, I mean, we were doing Eastern Bloc countries at that point. We were in like Prague, we were in Bulgaria and Poland and all yeah, these wacky places when, yeah. when they were still, you know, behind the iron curtain. It was crazy. It was, it was a learning experience. You know. Yeah. So what, at that time, what was, uh, what were the expectations of Tina Turner? I know she likes high energy. Uh, what, did she want yes. you to dig in? That would have been a great gig for you. It would have been great for you, Rich. <laughs> da -da stone, da -da stone. <laughs> um, so at that moment where she's like, I don't care if we're playing a hotel ballroom. I want, I want my drummer to dig in. And what were the expectations? What was she expecting of you every night? The same thing. I mean, the energy level was every night was through the roof, whether it was in the, in a ballroom, in the showroom, or you know where it ended up, but yeah, yeah. always high energy, high energy stuff. Yeah, up tempo, show tempo, old school show tempo stuff. You know, that's how she felt like she made all those songs. She did covers basically of everything, uh, and she made her made them her own by making them really fast. That was yeah. the thing. So, uh, and another thing that she was uh, that she really liked was uh, she had. Phil's, you know, dancing was her big thing. The, the, you know, she had a couple of dancers and, and it was almost more important to her, you know, the, the dancing thing. And she wanted the, the drums to hit certain things or do a fill in a certain place or flam was one of her favorite words. So do a flam, you know, okay, where? <laughs> here, over here, do a flam. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is the best seat in the house, Jack. All those dancers. I mean, come on. That's like pre-twerking, but I mean, high energy, man. Just she's always had great it dancers. Got better and better and better. Oh, man. Yeah. It always. And it got even better. So, so um, that you, you know how rare it is. I'm sure you've been told a million times and you know it because I know you're a grateful, humble person, but to hold a job for 28 years is like is like seven presidencies you saw all these changes you're you're sitting back there how many times did the band or management or the things change before your eyes and every new era you're behind the drums well this can all change but i gotta have jack on the drums i mean that is a testament to your i, I, I I think it was. Well, I think it was. I thought she never, you know, said that to me. But um, 
there were three of us, four of us really, who from the very original start back in when I first got the gig, that were there, this core of guys, you know, and uh, she just liked having her a band. She liked having her her boys back there. She liked having her drum, you know, it's like that's the way she was. I don't yeah. guess it's an old school thing. I don't know, but fortunately, uh, it worked for a while, you know, a good long while. But yeah, things changed. Things morphed. I mean, it was just amazing to watch it all go down, you yeah. know, from from that and just explode into what an explosion superstardom yeah and i gotta tell you i i had to ask you this question of course i could have looked it up on the google nader but there's this uh mm -hmm. you know film that was shot in santa cruz california called the lost boys and there's this muscly greased up saxophone player that also happened to be in every tina turner video and live concert and this guy's playing keyboards he's playing percussion he's hitting simmons pads he's got the saxophone who is that guy timmy capello yeah timmy capello he's a new york guy uh timmy was a character man and he was a great musician um and and that was in his you know when you saw him all there uh oiled up and you know yeah that was in his kind of uh his bodybuilding state he transformed after that into a, a more um what did timmy do after that he got micro macrobiotic after and so that he just on another tour just got leaner he down a bit yeah he did and uh it, it changed things but yeah tina loved that to have she needed somebody else on the stage to play off of you know she wanted that you know yeah, she was fine with, with that kind of larger than life character. And I mean, she always had somebody there. There's probably saxophone players all over the world that are like, you know, shredding giant steps. And, and they're just so angry at that guy because he figured it out. It's like, look at guys, <laughs> just lift a couple of weights, oil up and, you know, sell it. I mean, he was a salesman. I mean, wow. People loved him. They, yeah. they really, you know. So what's he doing now? Are you guys all keep in touch? I mean, you're in the band all these decades together. No, no, I haven't spoken to Timmy in a long while. Uh, the last I heard, Tim was uh, in Nyack, up uh, just outside of uh, Manhattan. I don't think it's very far. Um, yeah. I heard he was teaching up there huh? in school. So. That's great. That's yeah. great. And so then, I don't Tina know if he's still you know, huge. Or yeah, or what? I don't know what he did. Tina's got the um, same manager as Joe Cocker, and so this is what is incredible. It's like, okay, not only does Jack hold down a gig for twenty eight years, he's also going to hold down a gig with Joe Cocker for twenty one years. And there was also a lot of like where you were double dipping and doing both of the gigs at the same time, right? And if there was a problem, how did who got the first? It was like. I'm going out with Joe. I mean, how, did they understand? I mean, how does that work? I'm I'm not sure how it all came down, you know, but the uh, it seemed like uh, it it worked out great. Uh, there were yeah. only one or two times where it didn't. Uh, Tina would go out. Uh, Joe would be home. Um, Tina would come in. Joe would go out. You know, uh, it it worked out like that for years. There was one instance where uh joe was going to open for tina i couldn't do that obviously and i couldn't do i couldn't do both because there were some gigs that joe did that weren't with tina so i mean i have done both uh shows with with tina you know with other people but um um so it worked out for the most part on that and then there was a Really was that was the biggest thing. There was another time with Joe, and it didn't involve Tina. Um, you know, I had an opportunity to to jump on a um, uh, an Elton John tour because in the middle of one, and uh, I just spoke to Joe and his tour tour manager at the time. Said, you know, it, it, it's, uh, Joe was at the end of his tour, really close to the end. I said, this is not, I'd love to do this. You know, maybe we can get. He usually had, there were a couple of guys that did it. Kenny Aronoff was one of them. Right. Um, I'm not sure if Kenny came in at that time, but yeah, you know, they were, they were, Joe was great about it. So yeah, yeah. do the gig, you know, so, that's, that's I, did, so you know, I just wanted to keep on working. Joe was about to finish up and it's like, wow, man, I'm, 
I have an opportunity to not only play with Elton, but continue to work here, you know, which was. So how long was that Elton tour? When, what year was that? Uh, 1998. It's called the big picture. Um, and I did the second half of it and carried on with him for a couple of years and would have been more than happy to stay there. I mean, I was, that was a great, that was the best gig I ever had. I mean, I Saturday mean, night's all right for fighting Rocket Man, Daniel, Yellow Brick Road. Come on. Um, yeah. Get back, Honky the Cat. Tunes, yeah. Come on. Whew. The tunes are so cool to play. I, I was especially uh, fond of the older ones, you know. Um, but, um, um, yeah, it ended up, uh, it, it never stopped working never stopped working uh no matter what it took so we carried on for a couple of years and then uh somewhere around i think it was just it was in 1999 not not too far away from the millennial new year's and they were talking about doing a tour tina and elton together and i said uh you know it's like i made my choice i, I let Elton's people know i was very happy with with that i'd done, done tina for a long, long time. I was ready to do something new. Yeah. So, um, but then there was a famous, they did something together. Uh, it was a VH1 Diva show, which was really good, by yeah. the way. Uh, we were the house band. We played with Tina. We played with Elton and some other people, uh, Leanne Rhymes and Cher. And, anyway, it was fun. Um, but they had a spat. And then the tour was off. The, the, the two of them touring was off. And so, uh, and then Elton went off and did, uh, you know, whatever he had to do to continue to work. He, he lived a pretty lavish lifestyle. Um, and I'm sure still does, but, um, he, uh, he was doing solo piano gigs or, or him and Ray Cooper would do gigs, uh, yeah. anything to just keep it going. So he wasn't using a band. I had two little kids. I didn't want to wait. I, I needed to work. So I started with Tina and, uh, in 2000, yeah, another tour. Yeah. And carried on for the rest of it. Amazing. I mean, man, that was, you know, I don't know if I ever shared with you, but that was my kind of introduction into music and falling in love with music was Elton John's greatest hits volume one on eight track 1977. <laughs> I just knew oh, wow. like this is, this music is just timeless. And, and, and that was so many years ago and it's still the great American songbook. I mean, everyone you've played with is unbelievable. I mean, to be able to play, you know, uh, I mean, private dancer and all that stuff. And then don't even get me started with Joe Cocker. I saw footage of you doing um, help from my friends. It was a really well shot concert. I think it was about maybe 2010 or something. Um, and Jack, the the commitment to the quarter note, I mean, that thing did not budge. It's soulful and it's powerful, but I don't do 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 I mean, dude, it, it was so impressive. I'm like, this guy has got a metronome installed in his body. So solid. So inspiring, man. Uh, I, 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 I have, uh, you know, I don't have, I have a chop and, uh, uh, what I got is, uh, I got some good time and I got, uh, a good feel, but I, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, facility to buzz around the drums or any of that stuff. But, but no, but not even, not, 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 we're not talking like gospel chops, but like all the right stuff. So when you do your, all the, there's all the little notes and then all the big notes. And so it's like your hands are there. And how did, how did that happen? If you, you never really studied the rudiments or like, um, like marching snare drum books, how did you get when that? I was, you know, tw when I was, you know, nine, 10, 11. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was, I was playing those little marching, those little tiny well, well, um, little cadence books, place, but it, I don't know what they were called, but you know, they, they probably put them on their snare drum when they were marching, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. tiny, books in his first narrative but anyway yeah that's what that's what i was reading at the time yeah so um yeah i played all that stuff but it didn't last for long man uh yeah so kind of like the, the oh. kind of like that kind of stuff 
Yeah, well, yeah, there were there were a lot of uh, a lot of flams. <laughs> well, that paid off because Tina loved plenty, flams. Plenty. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I, you know, it just evolved. I, you know, the, the whole learning process of playing all kinds of different tunes with a lot of different bands, and you copy guys whatever they're playing, and you eventually learn how to play some yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, for, well for sure. Well for sure you did, man. It just sounds sounds and feels so great. The tone is fantastic. The time, the feel. Um, what are some of the, these other jobs that you kind of filled in along the way? You worked with Richard Marx and Peter Frampton. Taj Mahal. Did that come from like uh, Tony Bronigal? Because isn't Tony Bronigal work with him all the time? Are you guys? Yeah, pals? Taj Mahal came. Yeah, I'm I'm friends with Tony for sure. Um, he had been playing with um, Robert Cray at the time. He was in a band called the Phantom Blues Band. That's right. Um, blue, uh, yeah, with Mike Finnegan. Mike Finnegan had been playing uh, organ with Joe um, on a couple of tours. So, uh, and that was Finnegan's band, Phantom Blues Band. And they had done stuff with Taj already. They had done an album or two. Um, and um, and I knew the other guys in the band just from LA from you know the horn players uh, larry filcher was the bass player i'd known for years in, in la um joe sublet daryl leonard the horn players that you know the, just from playing living and playing around la i knew the, i knew all of them um so when tony couldn't do it they larry called the bass player and uh, you know the uh, Taj, Taj and the Phantom Blues Band were doing a tour with Bonnie Ray, Bon Taj. You know, do you want to do it? It's like, hell yeah. Uh, yeah, I love Taj. I mean, I've always loved Taj Mahal. He's one of my all-time faves from the get-go, from the first time I heard him. So I was just, it was really exciting for me to be able to place those tunes. So yeah, I went out to LA and played with the guys and just did that gig. Uh, that's, that's how they came about once again. I knew the guys in the band, I, you know, just people I'd been around before, yeah. you know, which is usually the case. Somebody in the band knows somebody. Yeah. You know? I mean, you can't it's know like enough people. I, that. I guess that's the moral of the story is that you want to, you know, play with as many people as possible. And so they have a, an idea of what, if they can recommend you, you know. Exactly. So, yeah, you play with as many people as possible. If they like what you do, they're going to recommend Absolutely. you. Whatever. Yeah. Okay, and then so. what about... Or, uh, I love Tony and the Robert Cray band. I mean, it's kind of flawless, oh, man. man. I mean, he that band is so sick. good. That band is sick. T- Tony was great. I'd heard him. We did we did a gig together um, with Robert Cray and Taj. Um, it was it Catalina Island? I, mean, that, I don't know if you've ever been out there. You lived I, in LA for a while. I know it's kind of like it was it, great. So I it's like Santa there. Monica. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, only further out in the water. Yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, we we played out there. Um, and Tony was great. Uh, it's killer. It's, he's great. Great drummer. So yeah. I don't know what went down. That gig ended, but uh, somebody else had that gig recently. Herman Matthews. And he went to do it. And uh, and Herman, I don't know if you're familiar with his playing, but he's yeah. like butter. I it mean, is. his groove is just... Uh, it's it fat. Can't be beat, I know. know. He was playing with uh, it's, Hugh Laurie, the actor, you know, from... Uh, house i guess he plays a mean piano and i think he was doing that job for a while and then i remember his first break was getting the big tower of power gig after like russ mckinnon and garibaldi and he played, well he filled in for garibaldi and he just played the shit out of that it was just he's so fluid he's so inside you know he has this french grip and he's just sort of massaging the sticks and his groove was so intense anyway yeah. Herman did that gig and then that didn't work out. He didn't last there that long. I was going, what is wrong with this guy, Rob Cray? What's the problem? Bronigal, Herman? What's the problem? You know, yeah, yeah, totally. I don't get it. Ah. <laughs> yeah, um, Tony. Well, Tony taught at my 2016 LA Drummers Weekend Camp. Kids loved him because it was so insightful. And you taught at my 2015. Can you believe that was seven years ago? That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. That's nuts. I know. The kids loved yeah, you well, because- the past two years. Well, yeah, I mean, I felt we lost two years of our lives, and I don't know what happened. Where did the time go? Jeez. <laughs> Crazy. Exactly. And then what about the um, little Richard Marks, Peter Frampton that's uh, action there? How did those 
things come up, and how was the experience? Richard Marks uh, was back just before I actually got the gig with Joe. Um, wow. And, oh, and then, uh, so we're talking his heyday. 92. Wow. Just, yeah, when Richard, he had just uh, made a transformation from his, you know, leather jacket, holy jean, thing, teen idol, screaming, screaming young girls to um, um, Armani suits and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So he, I don't know what, if he was in this Rod Stewart phase. I'm not sure what, what was going on. But anyway, that, but uh, I knew the guitar player. Paul Warren, great guitar player. I had worked with him um, in LA in his band uh, and just done stuff with him. So uh, he recommended me for the gig, somebody I worked with. Um, and uh, we did a lot of, um, he, Richard had signed this huge deal with Columbia, I think. I can't remember. But, um, and we did, uh, we rehearsed a lot and we did a lot of promo. We didn't do many gigs. We did mm -hmm. one. It was a really cool gig we did uh, in, uh, they, they recorded a show, I think it was in Germany, like 92 or three or something like that. But uh, we did very few gigs. We did tons and tons of promo with Richard. The band was great. It was slamming. His tunes were great. Oh, yeah. I loved playing those tunes. I think they our, our, our pal great. Mark Schulman did that gig for a while and maybe it was before. Mark Schulman, he, yeah. he, he did. It was before me because we were, uh, playing festivals. I was playing festivals with must have been with Tina at that point in Europe, and Richard was on the same festival or two, and Mark was there. Yeah, playing, and uh, so um, I can't remember how long it was after that, but it wasn't too long after that that we started playing together. But once again, we didn't do, get to do a lot of gigs, yeah. um, unfortunately. But but we did. The band did play, and it played well. It was good. Yeah, I mean, you're getting to play the American Songbook here, and then and then with uh, Frampton, you get to play "Show Me the Way," and then did the did he do the vocoder and break the whole thing down like it was 1974? Or? Yeah, he did, and that was just one little summer tour that oh, they opened or he opened for um, for um, Journey. Oh wow! And that was it. That was the end of my Peter thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gig, but his his fave guy at the time was uh, Chad Cromo, who you know, I'm sure, yeah. a Nashville guy. Well, he's kind of a California guy now, isn't he? Yeah, he kind of goes back and forth. He's mm -hmm. uh, yeah lost his house in the fire out there, which is horrible, and they're rebuilding. You know, jeez. Yes, he did. But yeah, great player. Wonderful. Peter loved him. I, I think he was available at that time. But um, anyway, I got the gig, um, and. Uh, yeah, all those tunes um, and uh, some other stuff from his, uh, you know, I wasn't real familiar with, with Peter beyond, excuse me, beyond uh, Frampton Comes Alive. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I didn't know how great a guitar player he was. Yeah. You know, yeah. what a rocker he was, you know. So, uh, um, but anyway, they were good. It was a learning experience for me. And yeah. It was cool. Yeah. Now, now, Jack, going back, <clears throat> um, I remember this. Uh, I started playing with inner monitors like in around 2000. But did you get to escape, um, you know, massive hearing loss? I mean, because you were on wedges like for a long time. Most of my life, yeah. Yeah. No, I lost, I lo I lost a lot of high end um, lots. I have hearing aids. My high end was shot to shit. Um, mm -hmm. Not as bad as some. I don't have any tinnitus or tinnitus or however you pronounce it. Oh, but, thank God. Um, yeah, I certainly certainly lost a, a lot of high end. Uh, sibilant sounds, and, you know, always saying what, you know, turn the TV up or whatever. But uh, I had to get hearing aids just to make it more better. It's yeah, well, they, they make them pretty but, sexy now where you really can't tell what's going on. You know, my dad has them. Uh, and he's got the sign on the shower that says hearing aids. So you remember to take them out when, with, before the shower. I've already done that a couple of times, uh, <laughs> but yeah, because uh, <laughs> uh, you forget you have them in your ears, you know, yeah. you step in. You, uh, fortunately, they tolerate moisture pretty well. Mm. So, uh, but yeah, so yeah, we had huge wedges and, you know, you played in, you played in these massive arenas and, you know, you, if you don't want to hear everything that's bouncing around the room out in front of you, you you're trying to play with the band. 
and you know, there's so much volume coming off the stage that um, if you want to overcome it, you need a lot of monitor. So um, yeah, large monitors, loud, um, and I hurt my ears. So. Yeah, but uh, in your and I still love wedges. I still love monitors. You know, as long as they're not blasted. You know, it's, it's just it's just more live. It's, just, it's nice you know, to hear that but, kick drum just just thumping through that thing with some high end attack. I always when mm -hmm. when we were on wedges, I was like, at the very least, let me at least put. Um, you know, vocal and kick. That's a great start. But also, like, say a guitar player starts a song or a st song starts with an acoustic guitar, you're going to want that thing in there. And then before you know it, this thing is like, it's on stun. Out of control. Yeah, you really have to filter some stuff out just to the stuff that you really need to hear. Yeah. Um, you know, just so that you can play with the band. You know? Have you tried the butt thumpers yet? The, uh, the Porter and Davies? I did. I had a... I haven't tried that one, and uh, I tried butt thumpers when they first came out. Right. Um, and, and, nah. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I'd love to try the Porter Davies, but uh, you know, I don't need it at this point. Yeah, they were too latent. Like the butt thumpers were way too um, latent. And then the really great thing about the Porter and Davies is that there is zero latency, no matter what volume you play. It's pretty incredible. Um, it's not the most it's comfortable just a buzz, thing, like but right. It just, it just, as soon as you hit that kick drum, boom! It just kind of vibrates your uh, right and left cheek. <laughs> stereo <laughs> buzz. It's a stereo <laughs> buzz. Yeah. So, so Jack, the last couple of years, you've been keeping yourself busy with Delbert McClinton. That's uh, what has it been? Five, six, couple of years, right? Here, Nashville-based band. Well, the past couple, of, past couple of years, we've been. Delbert retired uh, in during the pandemic. Oh, officially? So, wow. Uh, yeah. Well, from touring, from yeah. doing road stuff, uh, you know. But Cher, um, Cher did that five so, times, and she kept coming back. So maybe, maybe when the I, pandemic. I, 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 I would, I would love that. I, I love Delbert McClinton. Uh, I love his songs. I love the guy. Uh, I love the band. Um, I miss playing that stuff. Um, and. I, Another one of my favorites from way back, you know, it's just it's so great to be able to play his tunes, you know. Oh. So, um, so you know, I worked with him for six years until pandemic stuff happened and yeah. um, everything stopped, as you know. Yeah. So, yeah. I can't, that, that, uh, every time I roll the dice is just so fun and greasy. And that's going back many years now. D did you play on a couple of his records here in recent years? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I did. Thankfully, uh, yeah. He when he had the band, um, it, it was called the what was it called <laughs> self made men. The Delvin McLean self made men. So yeah, we did an album. Uh, I can't remember the title of it. I think it was just called Delvin McLean the Self Made Men, and then uh, okay. just one. And then he did another one, uh, and I I just did a couple of tracks on the. I think it was the last band one he did. Well, it was the last kind of uh, that particular group of, of guys. But um, did you play on Prick did, of the uh, Litter? Has, was that you on Prick of the Litter? Prick of the Litter. That was it. Prick of Is the that litter. the one? Thank you. Yes. I, I, I thought it sounded like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Prick of the Litter. Yeah, that's Delvin. <laughs> That, that's you know he, he he does great stuff with words uh, yeah but you know you get love his lyrics so yeah, anyway man. um yeah that was fun uh, that whole experience with Delbert was just great um, i love I it the, the whole deal yeah was james pa yeah, uh, pennebaker in the band the james, james pennebaker has yeah. been playing he'd been playing with Delbert since he was about 19 years old or maybe even earlier um yeah. back in texas <clears throat> I think he had been in and out over the years, but uh, I can't remember the timeline, but at some point, yeah, James came back in and we had two guitar players, Bob Ritt, James Pennebaker, both just excellent. Damn, what a band. <sighs> yeah, and James plays, you know, other stuff too, fiddle and pedal steel. Yeah. He plays drums. He's got a great groove too. You know, yeah, we did the uh, Pam guys. Tillis job together from 1999 to 2002. And so he did with James. Yeah. Yeah. He was the band leader, the fiddle player, 
mando acoustic guitar background vocals <coughs> crazy small sounds world. like james yeah he does all kinds of stuff was george marinelli did he play with pam tiller for a while do you know george um, George may have, but not during my tenure. I had like a three-year tenure there. And um, I'm sure you can relate to this, but, you know, the some of the gigs got to be more corporate and quiet, and I was behind this, this, the sneeze guard, blast shield, and playing. I was like behind the blast shield with brushes, and I was like, this is no longer fun. Um, you know, but uh, it's – and it, to leave a steady job is like, you know – it's not always the smartest thing, but I ended up leaving oh, and going to, uh, I went to, to uh, this group with Tim Rushlow from Little Texas, and we had a group called Rushlow, and we just pl- did like adult contemporary country, you know, and had a couple of soft hits. All the guys in the band mm-hmm. were the guys that I'm still playing with Al Dean with. So speaking, it's that same story of the relationships and trying to champion each other and get to this crazy yeah, thing together, you know? Yeah. So when you had to go behind the uh, the plastic barrier, which I can't, I hate. Yeah. Uh, I've refused, completely refused to play behind him a couple of times. Um, and uh, was it the sound man's choice, or was it because Pam? What, your cymbals were too loud for. Was it too loud for Pam, or was it the front of house guy? Cymbals, Pam. cymbals getting into the in Pam's um, mic, you know, which is. I think it's a it, it's a it's a thing, you know. It's a real thing, you know. These you, you got to hit the symbols. You got to. What are you gonna do? Um, but yeah, they have they have they have since. I've seen these little shields that people just put in front of sim. Yeah, you know, instead of the whole kit, because the kit sounds like crap. You know, have that thing, you know, it sounds bad. Yeah, you know. But also, you know, one one of the gigs I was doing, or a couple of the gigs I was doing, the sound man in the house, not our sound guy. Uh, I was like, yeah, we're gonna put this up. I was like, I'm not playing. I can play quiet. You know, I'll play quiet. I'm yeah. not. I won't. I'm not gonna bash the snot out of these drums with this band. It's not a loud band. Yeah. Don't worry about it. You know, it was fine. Yeah. You know, but um, I'm sure a lot of people can't or won't play quiet. I yeah. get it. It's yeah. a whole other deal. But yeah. So but yeah. it depends on the band too. Yeah. When you when you. When you went to um, L.A., you were like, well, it's not my goal to be a studio musician. I just want to play music for a living, which you did and are. Um, but did some things come up along the way? We're like, Jack, we were recording like what? Because I don't know what your body of work with is as a session musician, like with Tina or Joe, where there's some things that you played on. I did pick up some stuff, you know, it was just stuff among a lot of things. I was just trying to do whatever. I yeah. do anything. But yeah. I think Tina turned me on to uh, doing some stuff with uh, uh, what's Richard's last name. The guy who produced the Pointer Sisters, Richard. Uh, um, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I did some a couple of sessions for him. Um, I had done, you know, plenty of uh, or a lot of publishing demos that went on at that point. We did a lot of those uh, for songwriters, which was nice way to make a little money and learn more about recording stuff um but um i did a cool i did a couple of albums there at that point in time uh there was uh uh, uh this really bobby king and, and terry uh what was terry's last name they they'd been playing with them terry evans bobby king and terry evans these two guys are great singers. Um, you know, uh, they had been singing with Ry Cooter at the time. So they did an album. And this was another time, Bronigal. It was another Bronigal thing. And this was way back. I can't remember. Bronigal couldn't make the session. And somebody called me to see if I wanted to do this s- session. And I ended up doing the whole thing. It was like, you know, Buzzy Feeton was playing guitar and, and like all these cats. You know, uh, Reggie McBride was playing bass. Wow, man, it was it was fun. But no, there wasn't a ton of stuff. There was I don't have a body of recorded work. There was there was. I, I just demos. didn't know if there were some uh, big Tina or Joe hits that you were on that I didn't know about. Well, I don't know about big Tina hits. I mean, I played on some of Tina's stuff <clears throat> after you know we had been together for a while. After she had come back, you know, made a huge. Back. Yeah, uh, and Joe's Joe's too uh, did a Joe album called uh, "Have a Little Faith." Um, okay, yeah, and there were some there were some cool tunes on that. 
So, you know, it just depends on the producer who they want to use. Uh, you know, they producers tend to like to have their own people in the people they can, that they trust, that they depend on, you know, their, their gig is on the line as well. You know, yeah, they want to, totally. they want to come up with the goods. Yeah. People so, work with who uh, they know, yeah. like, and trust. I mean, it's, it's an old story. Exactly. So, uh, but there was stuff along the way. Yeah. That's awesome. Are you set up at your house? Like all of us crazy people to, with uh, our microphones? Yeah. Well, that, that's, yeah, that's something that happened over the course of two years. Um, I, you know, jumped on that. Um, yeah, I've got a pretty minimal setup. I don't have major, you know, I've got eight channels, eight mics. And, nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, and I, I've been using Logic, and I'm slow on it. I can import, play, and export. If something, you know, messes up and I have to, you know, there's glitches and stuff, which seems to happen uh, often. Uh, I got to get on the phone or get on the Google or whatever, trying to figure stuff out. Yeah. You know, you just want to play the damn track, you know, I know I totally, <clears throat> um, I, I don't want to mess around with the technical aspect. I don't want to be an engineer, but, uh, yeah, I got set up. So, and it sounds pretty damn good for, you know, what I got. You know? Yeah. It doesn't take much to have a cool drum set. I did find out, <clears throat> you know, I was having to learn how to, you know, I had all these mics. I had eight mics and, you know, where am I going to put them? Looking online, and my favorite sound was two overheads, kick, and that was it. It sounded so damn good, just like that. But people want you know separate tracks, so yeah. You know, I had to have a, a engineer friend come over. We he mic'd everything, got my levels, and made sure there were no phasing issues and all that kind of crap. Oh yeah, <clears throat> I didn't know it. I was never interested in all that stuff. I really never was. I just wanted to play the tune. You know? yeah. <laughs> There's tons of guys who are, oh, what kind of mic was that? Do you use on the snare? I was like, I don't care. I mean, guys yeah. are really, really nerding mm -hmm. out with this stuff. And um, it's a lot. Of, it's really impressive because there's like, tons of guys here and in LA, friends of mine that are like, no, they just, they have become engineers, like self-taught engineers, yeah. running pro tools, doing the file management, sending things off to the client. They got mic options. I mean, I'm set up, ready to go. I got my snare drum choices. You can have the Vistalite. You can have the 1974 Ludwig. You can have a couple modern DWs. Uh, change the cymbals out. Change the snare drums out. Tons of percussion. But I have an engineer, and he's my drum tech, and we have the same schedule. So I'm like, hey, we've got Monday, Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday this week, and you know what we're doing? We're cutting. Um, you know, mm -hmm. which is which. You know, makes it a little weirder. You know, with COVID, because you're sitting here and you're both friends, and you're in the room with the mask on and everything. Oh God. It's it's really made things. Yeah, it is weird. It's just weird, you know. But, um, yeah, it is weird. Uh, uh, um, do you send out flat tracks to people, or do you do you send them, you know, stuff that process you, stuff? Your drum sounds are effect. Yeah, so, and you, you, people seem to want all flat stuff for the most yeah, part. Yeah, so they can yeah. add their they can they can EQ the way they mm -hmm. want and or add samples, you know, <laughs> which is like where we are as well. That happens. All the time, yeah. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But you made me think of, of uh, when you said you were in a room wearing a mask. I picked up a couple of days recording, um, two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm in this little studio, I'm, I'm playing drums, I got a mask on, the bass player's got a mask on, you know, it's, just, it's crazy, it's so weird. I know, it's so weird. I mean, I guess, I <laughs> guess if you're, you know, I've also, um, not worn the mask while I'm playing drums because if I'm like six or eight feet away from the guys on the floor and then I'll just wear it in the uh, control room in the lobby, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it just depends, you know? Walk, yeah. Walking yeah. around with a can of Lysol, I mean, Costco-sized <laughs> Costco vat of hand sanitizer. And a hazmat suit. Come on, man. It's crazy. <laughs> well, we'll, ho well, hopefully we'll get through this, man. But hey, so... Kind of like, uh, I'm sure you're asked this a million times, and there's some great resources of you, great interviews with you online. But if somebody's moving to a Nashville or a, a New York or an LA and they're a kid and they want to do the thing and they want to live the dream, how do you distill some advice down into a couple easy to remember things? Wow, man. I, you know, we talked about it already about just playing. I was playing with anything that was you know tossed my way and right. playing with d different people and it, it comes back on you, even if it's a crappy thing you know yeah. so 
you know, get out there and play. Yeah. Um, whatever it is, you know, do it. You'll meet people and, you know, everybody's trying to work their way up and do the same stuff. So, you know, it, it, that's a huge thing. But um, these days, you know, there's so much, there's so many great players around and so much less work. So, you know, if you get some tools in your pocket, it certainly helps, yeah. especially if you can read, re- read really well. Yeah. Know, uh, I think that's a big deal. I mean, you know, you have to like have other avenues open. You, you, you know, uh, you're not going to survive if, if you, if you, you can't play, you know, several styles, not all, but, you know, yeah. and, you know, being able to read and uh, just getting out there and playing a lot. I, I don't know how else to do it. I don't know sure. if it's changed. I'm, I mean, I'm kind of, be, I'm, I don't, I don't know how I do it if I was starting again. Yeah. 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 Probably the same way. You know, I think it's, I think I it's the same way, man. I, I, I really do. I mean, it's yeah. that, that's a story that, you know, I don't want to be like, get off my lawn, you know, be that guy. But the, the, like kids really are really, some of them are really hyper-focused now. And says, I am going to do sessions or I am only going to do my home studio thing. Or and they said like, I'm not going to do lower Broadway because that's musical prostitution. And, uh, it, you know, I was like, they, they have very specific ideas of what they're going to do. And when I moved here, I was like, I'm going to do anything and everything. <laughs> Because I know it's going to lead to something, you know. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, and the I, the only other thing I can say is, uh, you know, keeping it simple is the way to go. Yes, you know? less is more. Always less, less is more with the drums. With, it'll, at least with pop music, you know. Totally. Yeah, and I mean, if you're yeah. if you're like ding, uh, you know, playing playing your you know linear linear version of um a groove and playing dense fills eh, you might get a smile here or there but if you play boom whack and lay it down for three and a half minutes <laughs> everyone is smiling i mean everyone right. is smiling you know if it's in if the boom whack are in the right place yeah of course oh, for sure beautiful thing hey so in closing i'm just going to ask you like five questions there this is the fave thing usually i have my co-host here and we do the random question of the day sometimes it can get be really random but we'll just do these fast favorite color blue blue all right there's a lot of blue uh favorite food italian anything italian i love it and do you cook italian this this a little bit nice nice you know uh favorite yeah. To make sauce, yeah. you got to know. I, I, well, I'm, I'm definitely going to get the um, recipe from my mom, you know, because she's got the. There you go. She's That's handed down. Yeah. yeah, totally. Uh, favorite drink? Ooh, it varies. I yeah. do like vodka. Me I've been too. into old fashions lately. Are you talking about alcohol? We might as well. Yeah. <laughs> when I mean, you say, when you're talking drink, it's like water? No. No. Uh, That's no fun. I'm thinking alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hard liquor. Uh, old fashioned has been kind of good lately. Vodka's always good, but I like wine. I love wine. I, I feel like the same way. It's know. like if you're having a nice meal with friends and it's like chill, well, wine is great. There's health benefits. You know, if you're at a beer joint, you know, give me an IPA. And if you're like at a kind of a, a douche, douche, kind of like a West Hollywood hotel, you're, you you got to have some vodka, right? You got to have a martini or uh, something. Chill. Chilled vodka is, yeah, happening. Yeah. Very good. It yeah. is happening. We're on the same. And, and you know, about three years ago when you and I went, you picked me up in your little sports car and we went to this strip mall bar and we were complaining because there was <laughs> karaoke right. and it was too damn loud. And we were like, we were acting like get off my lawn, guys. And we were trying to shout above the music and have a couple beers. I would kill we were to go to that place, though. After well, two years now, of what yeah, has of happened, course. I would kill for that. And that's what we—that's what we miss most, you know. Our, our our gig is our gig, and it's where we socialize. I mean, it's just where every, it's it's everything, you yeah. know. It's where it all happens, you know. I know. So yeah, it's favorite song. Can do you have a favorite song that you will listen to? No, okay. No, no way. I, I, there's too many. Too many and good ones. Were you a Beatles guy, 60, 1964? Who's your favorite band? Absolutely. Loved. What's that favorite band? Another one. I, I, I can't. Although they are amazing. Um, 
especially have you seen that doc that's been on uh, did you watch all nine hours i i i I had to do some skipping but it was i i did i did it i did it too and yes they they certainly have felt a lot uh but you know they're but in the end it was just amazing how it all came together and and just you know the you just have a you, you always knew they were great but it just reinforced for me just how great they were as songwriters and players and how great Ringo was, you know? Yeah. And it's just so damn good. So I don't know if the Beatles were my favorite. There's lots of great bands out there. Damn. I, I Yeah. That's I, a hard one, right? Yeah. I don't have a favorite band. There's there's a lot of great songs. There's a lot of great bands. I, I, you know, well, I at least we know you love Italian favorite. food. You know, you, you, you like your <laughs> cocktails music. and you love the color blue. <laughs> hey, you know who says hello? I just interviewed him. Taku Hirano. Wow. I haven't seen Taku in a long time. He was another guy I saw, Precious. you know, on the road. Yeah. He was playing with uh, Lionel Richie, uh, who had done a bunch of stuff um, uh, with Tina. Yeah. Great, great player, great bands. God, what's, what was his drummer's name? Uh, Lionel's guy. Oh, was it so uh, damn good. Oscar Seaton or? Yes. Yes. Oscar. Damn. Jesus. I'm like a, 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 a nerdy lexicon of, of, who has what gigs and what periods of the music business because I read modern drummer magazine. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> do they even exist anymore? Do they have well, a, they, a, it's a, surviving? A, it is surviving. They have a new publisher, a new owner, and I wouldn't be surprised if it all goes online pretty soon. You know, I mean, to be, so I was going to ask you if they, do they still have a hard copy? You, you know, they do. copy or is it all? Yeah. Okay. You were, I'm sure in the magazine over the years, right? I had to be. remember I did an I did an interview with some drum mags. Uh, I, I did an interview with a girl uh, who had a piece in a, in a modern drummer. It was yeah. a while ago. Right? Yeah, you are one of the guys, man. The you know the Mount Rushmores of working drummers in the last four decades, man. And it's unbelievable that uh, you're a friend of mine and you'll send me emojis and weird uh, memes. I, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> I just love it that I have your sure. phone number. <laughs> we'll share sauce recipes. I know at some point, brother. Oh my God. Well, well thanks for doing know, this. Man. When, when you when absolutely. And when we're through limiting our exposure, we can uh, get together and have a beverage or two. Totally brother, so man, do what we're supposed to be doing. Thank you so much. And hi, Hey, uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? If they wanted to try to find you, do you do uh, Facebook, Instagram? Through you. Do- Call, call Rich. Call me, guys. Uh, no. If you guys, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I don't have Instagram. I'm not a. I, I have a Facebook. It's, it's just my personal page. Nice. Okay. Know, under okay. So name. you heard it there, I, guys. I don't have- Troll Jack on his personal <laughs> Facebook page and beg him every day for 365 days to be his personal friend on Facebook. But you guys heard it there first. This is a wonderful conversation. And uh, to all you guys out there in podcast land, thank you for supporting our podcast, man. We're going to be here celebrating the good stuff. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Leave us a five star rating. Give us a nice review. It really helps people yeah, find the like, podcast. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Come on, guys. All all right. Thank you guys so much. And uh, Jack, we'll see you soon. Thanks for doing this. Rich, good to see you, man. Hope to see you in person. Heck yeah, brother. Talk to you soon. Adios. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.